This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today I am fulfilling yet another bucket list guest that's been a long time coming. I will be talking to Marilyn Lightstone. Marilyn is a multi-talented actress, voiceover artist, graphic artist, um, talk show host, radio host, painter. I mean, there's nothing this woman can't do. She is so talented, and we're going to be talking today. You know, she was the uh, voice of the Evil Queen in the uh, Den segment of Heavy Metal. And um, she's been in some great movies like um, Lies My Father Told Me, In Praise of Older Women, um, the horror classic Spasms, which is very underrated. Um, She guest starred on a lot of shows like Cheers and Cagney and Lacey and Starman, the series. She was on Avonlea as a recurring character. Uh, she did voices for the new Scooby-Doo, Mysteries, Dance the Menace, Challenge of the Go-Bots, uh, the real Ghostbusters. She's done a lot of work. It's going to be a great talk today. I can't believe I finally got through to her on social media, and we're finally going to make this happen. I cannot just wait. Uh, September, autumn, September is just so awesome, and it's going to keep getting more awesome as the next two weeks wear on until... Halloween October launches, which is going to be a real toe curler in and of itself. So yeah, here is my interview with Marilyn Lightstone. Hello? Hey Marilyn, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh John, thank you so much. Yes, this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. What can I tell you today? So, going back in time, uh, you've worn so many hats. Uh, You've been an actress, photographer, painter, writer, radio TV host, graphic artist. Were you a creative child growing up in Canada? Uh, Yes, I was. (laughs) Yes, I was. I I sort of spent most of my time drawing and uh, singing songs and making up plays with my friends. Wow. What age did you start uh, gravitating toward acting? Oh, gosh, I really don't know. I'm far too old to answer that question. A very long time. (laughs) Did you um, get involved in school plays and community theater? Yes. uh, Well, there wasn't much community theater around at the time, but I I did get involved in school plays, Christmas concerts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Were there any uh, specific movie stars that you idolized that uh, you gravitated toward? No, I really didn't. We, uh, I grew up in Montreal in the province of Quebec in Canada, and um, the situation was very unusual. There had been a, a, a theater in a, in a movie, a fire in a movie theater at some point, I don't know, in the 20s or the 30s. Wow. And by the time I was born, kids were not allowed to go to the movies until they were 16 years old, except, of course, for, you know, kids' programs and stuff like that. But we weren't allowed into the movie theaters. So I uh, didn't get to see much movies when I was a kid. Really, was radio was what kind of influenced me. Wow, that is interesting. There's a wonderful show called Lux Radio, radio Theater. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I don't know when they stopped you know, listening to it, but I remember being in, my, in my, my family home, and my parents would be in the kitchen with my grandmother, and they would be listening to Lux Radio Theater. And I was supposed to be in bed at that time. <laughs> but uh, they probably knew this, but I sneaked out of bed, and I sort of moved just around the wall on the other side of the kitchen, just around the door, the doorway, and listening to uh, radio versions of um, of American movies. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, a lot of people um, in those days listened to the radio a lot, and they would hear like you know soap operas and stuff. Yes, yes, and I, oh, I remember that a little. All kinds of stuff. I remember the soap opera sort of sitting in my in my friend's uh, in friend's home and having having a lunch as we had our our summer vacation. I used to spend some time with my at my friend's cottage and uh, her mother used to. I can't remember the name, but it was a it was a widow in a mining town. I remember something very dramatic like that. But uh, will the so and so you know to sort of get out of the problem she's in or marry the man that she loves? But I, I think that's what got me into into um, into acting and also just reading. I was a great, great reader. And uh, luckily for me, um, my mother was too. Now, I, my family didn't have very much money, so my mother belonged to um, 
these commercial book clubs. I don't know whether they still have them, but mm -hmm. you sort of would, would sign up with a publishing company, and they would, for a certain, you know, fixed sum, usually quite modest, they mm -hmm. would send you three books of your choice, of, well, like that. So they were in a, you know, in a, um, a book bookcase in our dining room, and. Um, there were certain books that I was not supposed to read because I was, oh, well, about 12 years old at the time. And um, there were some very racy novels, one called Forever Amber, Amber I remember. And um, I used to read my, my mom's books when she was out doing the shopping. I would read her books, even though I wasn't supposed to. So I, I was hooked on stories a long time ago. Was uh, Tropic of Cancer one of them? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think even, I don't know if that was published at the time. I'm quite old, Tom, so it, that's, I can't, I really can't remember. Frankie Arby, though, I remember one of the, uh, one of the, the authors that was quite possible. So they were kind of historical romances, mostly. Yeah, you're, you're talking about like the Book of the Month Club, something like that, you know, where they That's sort of it, the, sort of like that, yeah. Wow. So you attended uh, McGill University, did you study acting there? Uh, there was no acting course. There, there was actually a, quite a policy at the university that um, there was there was no acting program at all. If you you studied the literature of the theater, you studied plays. I was an English major, and I think I probably read you know every every play that was ever written. But we did not have any kind of acting courses at the time. Mm -hmm. My first acting school was when I, when I finished McGill. I had my my BA degree, and uh, luckily for me, um, the only full time theater school in Canada, the National Theatre School, was opened during my last year of university mm -hmm. and in my hometown of Montreal because um, I didn't have a dime to go off to New York or to London to study and that was what happened to most people interested in acting before this acting school opened in Montreal. If you, your choice was sort of made as to what your career would be. If you went to London, mm -hmm. you would probably wind up staying in London or, or New York sort of a different kind of acting career. But uh, that would have been impossible for me because I, I didn't have a cent, not a sou after university. So just at that time, the National Theatre School opened and I auditioned during my last year of university and was accepted, and that's where I spent the next three years. Wow. Did any of your uh, classmates go on to become successful in acting? Oh, lots of them, lots of them, lots of them. It, it's, it became a very wonderful wonderful school, and uh, a lots of actors, you know, came from the National School. Yeah. Yeah. Did you uh, go to New York after that? I spent some time in New York, but I, I went because um, I was sort of sent there. Um, one of the, I, I was working at the Stratford Festival at the time, and um, the, um, one of the directors, who was a kind of a fan of mine and a friend named John Hirsch, an extraordinary director, he had done a lot of directing in New York at Lincoln Center and other places. And they were looking for someone to play Goneril in a production of King Lear with Lee J. Cobb. And uh, he told them they should get in touch and they should hire me. So I left the Stratford Company with their blessings and went to New York to play Goneril in King Lear. And that's when it was my first time in, in New York and uh, returned sometime afterwards to do a, an unusual production called Tamara, mm -hmm. um, which ran for years and years and years at the, the Armory in New York. And this was a very unusual production in which the audience was split up into, I think it was 10 sections following 10 different actors in this great large building, which was dressed up to become Il Vittori Alley, which was where uh, an, an historic figure named D'Annunzio, an Italian, mm -hmm. lived during during the war, First World War. And um, that was an extraordinary experience, actually, because I, I really I think every actor should have that that experience because you were, the audience was all around you, close up. There was no, we were not on stage. The audience was divided into 10, each assigned to a certain character, which they then could, they could switch characters if they wanted to. But they followed them all through this building, which was like three stores, mm -hmm. stories, and with a kitchen where cooking was going on and a dinner situation and a highly, highly unusual production, which um, it really kind of formed my way of thinking about the theater. Is that one of the uh, highlights of, uh, of, of theater in those days for you? Thank you, Gordon. I'm telling you, you're not exactly clear, Tom. Can you I'm sorry. anything about that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, well, slightly muffled. 
I'm sorry. Was that one of the uh, highlights of theater um, in those early years for you? Uh, well, it wasn't so early, actually. I was already kind of well-established, but it certainly was a highlight. I I performed the, the role that I played. I, I did it for one year in Los Angeles. It went on to one you run many, many more years after that. Mm-hmm. And then I did it for another year and a half in New York. So it, it, it was a highlight. Well, it was a very unusual kind of acting situation, a, a unique, because you were not on the stage. You were living as if you were really living in a real place, and people just happened to be gathered around you, mm-hmm. right at your elbow, or following you down corridors, or, you know, turning you, frowning up the stairs, or... Hard to explain without being there. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> while while you were there, I mean, did you try to uh, get into the actor studio or HB Studios or anything like no. that? No, I didn't. No, no. I didn't. Yeah, because it was a magical time in uh, New York to be an actor. Like, everyone could afford to live there and everybody knew each other. It was before the internet. It was a magical time. Well, I mean, it was a, a terrific experience for me. But I never intended to, to stay in New York because... My, my partner lives in Canada. He was actually the producer mm-hmm. of this performance of Tamara and um, in, in L.A. and in New York. And I knew eventually, uh, you know, I'd be coming back to Canada. So um, I, I really was not immersed in American theater. I'm, I'm a Canadian. Nice. The, the first uh, big movie, according to IMDb, was Lies My Father Told Me. Uh, was that a standard <laughs> audition for you? Beg your pardon? Was that a standard audition for you? Um, well, a favorite audition? I'm sorry, what kind of audition? I'm sorry, a standard audition. A standard? Uh, no, I I don't quite know what you mean by a standard. You mean like an open audition where people, a whole bunch of people? Yeah. No, no, I was asked to do this part. Mm -hmm. You were just offered, they saw you on stage and um, just got offered to it? Yes. Yeah. What did you... At that time, I sort of had to establish myself, you know, in the the community in, in Toronto. Yeah. What, uh, what did you think of the script? Uh, of of, um, my, of Lies My the, Father what, Told Me. The whole, the whole experience was just great because, um, mm-hmm. first of all, it was a movie that was set uh, in a neighborhood that I grew up in, in Montreal. Mm-hmm. So I, I knew the texture of this community very, very well. And um, it was my first movie, and um, I, I just loved it. I just loved it. I had wonderful, wonderful you know, fellow actors and a wonderful little boy playing my, my son, mm-hmm. and uh, who'd never acted before, but he was six years old, and he was just tremendous little kid, so um, no, a, a terrific experience. Also, it just reminded me, we, we, um, the set that we worked on was so much like the neighborhood in which I grew up, and in one case, we actually were doing a, a scene that we were looking for an, for an apartment, a flat, actually, mm-hmm. and the, 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 during this scene in the movie, I, I just felt like I was transported back to the time when I was a kid because this was the same neighborhood that I grew up in and all my friends grew up in. Mm-hmm. Did you grow up in a Jewish neighborhood? It was a Jewish neighborhood, a French-Canadian neighborhood, an immigrant neighborhood, uh, a real an interesting mix. It's now, you know, at the time it was a very, you know, low economic level kind of neighborhood, but it is now very trendy and very popular in Montreal. It has a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of, um, oh, I not the word, but... Uh, with any, anyway, everyone wants to live there. At the time, everyone was trying to get out of that neighborhood, but at the, but now everyone wants to live there because it's considered very trendy and very chic and very fashionable. Yeah, it's a wonderful movie. Um, I, I I read that Anthony Quinn and Zero Mostel were originally cast, but for whatever, whatever reason, they didn't do the movie. Yes. Well, we had a wonderful uh, actor, an Israeli actor named Yossi Adin, mm-hmm. who um, had his own theater in, in Tel Aviv in Israel, and um, and he performed the role and, and very, very well indeed. Yeah. I, I, I love the way you laugh at the beginning of the movie when you're being tickled. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ticklish. <laughs> yeah, so. same here. <laughs> How did uh, you get cast in, in Praise of Older Women? Yeah, there was. was uh, were you offered that part? Yes, I was. Yeah, this was a bold movie for its time. I mean, I think it really cemented how free spirited, open minded Canadians are, especially it, well, with nudity and in film in general. Um, like when when you read the script, was this like, oh yeah, this is my kind of movie? Um. 
well, I was asked to do this role. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of open-mindedness of Canadians, the Canadians might have been open-minded, but at the time, um, the police... We thought we, we thought we'd be raided by the police when it was performing at, at um, <laughs> the film festival, the Canadian Film Festival in Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it wasn't, you know, kind of removed from the, from the, the program of the film festival. But um, there were sort of, you know, hints that that might be the case. Mm -hmm. When you look back on it now, it really is quite mild when you consider some of the things that we accept and see on the screen. But at the time, it considered very raunchy. Oh yeah, this is before Adrian Lyne was making movies like Fatal Attraction and Nine and a Half Weeks and all of that. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, Tom Berenger, he was coming off of Looking for Mr. Goodbar. What was he like to work with? Uh, he was a very sweet guy. He was there with his wife, mm -hmm. and I sort of they sort of kept themselves. And uh, except for you know the hard time on set, we really didn't spend any time together. So I really didn't get to know him. But mm -hmm. he was a lovely young man and um, very hardworking. It was a pleasure. Uh, w w was there any indication that he would become the huge star that he became? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. He, you know, he did a nice job, but I, I can't say that. He startled anyone by his, you know, whether he was doing on on screen. He he did his job very well. Mm hmm. Were Were you comfortable having uh, the sex scene with him? Well, I wouldn't say comfortable, but you know, I'm an actress, and yeah. that's what you do. You do things. You make things that are not comfortable to you personally. You're you're playing a character, and uh, you, you just have to say to yourself, "There's this is not me doing this. this is my character." So uh, that's what the job is about. Mm -hmm. You you came in there like Mrs. Robinson. You came in there so seductively. I, I think it was, it was brilliant what you did. Well, thank you. Yeah. A long time ago, my dear Tom. It's probably more, more present in your mind than it is on mine. Yeah. <laughs> a very long time ago. Well, it's a movie Your I can, lady. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a movie I can relate to because I lost my virginity to an older woman when I was 18, so... Oh, did you? Yes, okay. I did. Okay, so you took it personally then. Absolutely. Yes. Well, for me, it was an acting job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when CBS aired it here in the U.S. for the first time, they cut out like 27 minutes of it, which is really, which is really, really? bizarre. I'm surprised that they even showed it at all on CBS. I'm amazed, too. <laughs> So then you uh, provide the uh, voice of the queen in uh, heavy metal in the den uh, sketch. Uh, how does that come into your life? Well, you know, I never saw the, the film. Uh huh. I did. The, I remember doing the job. I remember we were, we worked late at night, mm -hmm. and um, that's all I remember doing that. But I don't remember anything else about it. I never read the full script, and I never mm -hmm. saw the movie. Oh, it, 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 it is a crowning achievement in animation, I have to tell you. It still holds up all these years. I talked to the director, Gerald Potterton, last year, and he just died about a month or so ago. And I, I, it, is, it, is, it is such a great movie that holds up. And what I love about you doing the voice of the Queen is that your, your voice is so commanding, and your voice hasn't changed all these years. It still sounds the same. Well, I get a lots of chance to use it, so it doesn't get rusty. <laughs> yes. Do, do you remember if you recorded in the same booth as John Candy? I can't remember. I don't think he was there that day, no. No. Did you, do, do you remember if you ever met him? Oh, yes. I met him before he went, to, you know, left to Canada and go to the United States, but I didn't know him well. He's sort of the next generation after me. He's sort of not a contemporary, so I, I, I did meet him, but um, we never worked together, and we didn't spend any time together, you know, just socially or in any other way. But such a nice guy, though. He seemed to be, actually. I knew a lot about it. I knew a lot of the people that he, he worked with, you know, vaguely, not, not intimately, but... Um, they were very well known in the community, and uh, you sort of knew what was happening in their lives and how they behaved and how they worked. And they, they were quite a group. They were quite a, quite a group. I think Canadians are very, generally very generous performers and working with other people. They are. You know, they have a lot less ego than Americans do. They don't have that it's all about me quality. You know, I don't know, I don't know what it is. I mean, I've interviewed so many Canadians, and they are all just the sweethearts. I mean, just well, sweethearts. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, and they're all open-minded. Probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> But, but nice to hear. In general, though, there's, there's a kind of a civility, 
you know, in the business in, in here, which is, I, I don't know, I, I, when I went to finally to, you know, to L.A. and to New York, mm-hmm. it, it, it wasn't quite the same, but maybe just because I didn't know the players as well. I, so I really can, you know, I'm not prepared to uh, send out sort of um, credos about what happened at that time. But, um, no, a, a good group. Yeah, they have a, a great sense of humor, too. Um, you were in a um, anthology movie called Love. Do you remember that? I do remember that, and that, <laughs> that is actually a bit of a joke because that was the, the, the part of the movie in which I was performing. I was performing with my partner. Mm-hmm. Asked us to perform together, and he's actually quite a performer himself in, in many other ways. But when it came time <laughs> to filming this. He suddenly got very shy, and he kind of was having trouble performing. And I sort of kind of verbally kind of shook him and said, this is an acting job, and just smarten up, you know, and do, your, do what you, you, were, you know, were programmed to do and what you rehearsed to do. But yeah. he became very shy all of a sudden. I don't know what happened to that movie. It sort of disappeared, actually. Yeah, it's got uh, Joni Mitchell in the segment, and it's got uh, Lawrence Dane, who passed away recently, and uh, Nicholas Campbell, who's uh, one of the hitchhikers on that on that horror series. Oh, he's a great actor. He, you know, I've worked with him on a number of a number of times, a couple of times actually, uh, in a, in a production that I in, I was doing, I was directing and producing, and he's he's so talented. My gosh, he's a terrific actor. Yeah, is he still working? Do you know? Well, I haven't heard his name come up recently, but I don't know why. Maybe, he, I don't know whether he's left the country, whether he's still here, but I haven't heard anything about him. But um, I have very fond memories of him and, and any experience with him. He's, he's a real pro, a real pro and a terrific, terrific person to work with. He, he gives a great, he gives everything. Mm-hmm. How about uh, spasms? Beg your pardon? Spasms. Spasms? Spasms. I'm familiar with that. Oliver Reed, Peter Fonda. I'm the, sorry, I'm not familiar with that. The William Fruitt movie you were in. Oh, sorry, it's Spasms? It's called Spasms. Spasms. I yeah. don't even remember what that was about. Yeah, it's about a... Um, oh, it's a, a very long time ago, Tom. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I always, I'm looking forward. I don't spend too much time looking. Spasms? I did a movie called Spasms? Yeah, it's about a, um, a, ser- a serpent... Uh, a killer serpent who like, um, who like you know kills people, and uh, you get like knocked across the lab by him. <laughs> oh, I saw. It. I think it was an early television thing, and oh no, that was just like I think I was basically an extra, and I remember being in in, um, in makeup for like tons and tons of hours, you know, in order to play this role. <laughs> No, it, it doesn't signify greatly in my memory or my career, Tom. I'm sorry. You're, you're being very thorough, but I, I can't follow you in everything. It was probably it was probably a television film in Canada, but out here in the U.S., it, it was released theatrically. Uh-huh. I, I don't think I ever saw it. Yeah. William Fruitt, he's a, a genius horror filmmaker. He should be up there with the greats, but he isn't, sadly. Um, how about The, the Wild Pony? Oh, the Wild Pony was lovely. Uh, working, uh, Kevin Sullivan was the the producer and the director, and uh, uh, a beautiful story. And um, working with two lovely kids, and you know, out in Alberta in the mountains, which was a great pleasure just before Christmas time. Beautiful scenery, and uh, I enjoyed doing that very much. Yeah, uh, that, was, that was the first time you worked with Art Hindle, right? Yes, yes. He's a great guy. I've interviewed him. He's a terrific guy. He's a ter- I haven't seen him in a long time, but he's, he was super working with him, and uh, always, always a pleasure. Yeah, you worked with him again on the Surrogate, uh, which was which was which had a great cast: Shannon Tweed, Michael Ironside, Vlasta Veranda, who I've also interviewed. Yeah, that's a great. Well, you're a real student, aren't you? A student of. Of, of us Canadians here, I, I probably don't know half as much as you do. I've been I've been a, a, a cinephile my whole life, and I do love Canadian films. Um, they're just they're I don't know what it is. I mean, it's like they're they're doing the American aesthetic, but in their own style, and it, uh-huh. it's it's hard to it's hard to uh, uh, pinpoint it. You know. Yeah, many people have tried, but it's difficult to do the uh, Canadian style. Yeah, <laughs> I love that episode of Cagney and Lacey you did. By that point, had you moved to L.A.? Uh, yes, yes, I was there. I really went down originally to um, to do a, a play 
in L.A., and then I stayed on afterwards for a while. And then I came back to Canada, then another point in time I went back to L.A. and stayed for several years. So I spent quite a bit of time in the United States. I might be interviewing Sharon Gless soon. What was she like to work with? Sharon, sorry? Sharon Gless, who was Cagney. Oh, well, you know, this was, this was just a very small role. Mm-hmm. They were, the two ladies were, were just great. And just, you know, they're professionals and gracious people. But it was just one scene that I had with them, an introductory scene in their show. Yeah, I thought you were. I thought you were going to be the killer the first time I saw it. But now when I watched it again recently, I was like, Nah, she's not the killer, because I just love how how cold blooded you are talking about um, about about what what an unliked person the actress was, you know, who got murdered, yes. you know, <laughs> and you do it in such a acting teacher like way. The way you explain the whole scenario, it's just it's brilliant. <laughs> very much. Well, I played a lot of sort of different characters, you know, during my life, but I don't think a killer was as included among them. Yeah. Mind you, Goneril in King Lear in New York was pretty funny. She didn't kill anyone herself, but she could easily have done it. Yeah. <laughs> How about guest starring on Cheers? Um, that was great fun to do. And, you know, it, it, so, it was such a hit show at the time that just to be, you know, be a part of it, and even for a brief moment. And it's so interesting because here I was at the time I did Cheers. I'd been, you know, working as a theater in the Indian in theater and as an actress for, I don't know, 25 years or something. And um, when Cheers came on, when it was broadcast, I had telephone calls. I was living in L.A. But I had telephone calls and letters, you know, from all over the country. So that was great fun. It was great fun, and uh, I also enjoy. I like doing characters with accents, or you know, every now and then it's kind of fun, and to do comedy as well. That is, is not necessarily comic comedy. You know, I'm not telling jokes, but a comic character and speaking lines that make people laugh is a kind of a, it's a kind of a bit of a high for for a performer. Yeah, and that was Shelley Long's last season too. Um, the whole the whole cast and writing staff was amazing. That was just a, a lightning in the bottle, amazing show. Mm-hmm. And they were so they were so kind and you know very generous with me and very you know caring so it, it was fun. I, I heard they were very welcoming to uh, guest stars, which is very rare on any show. Tremendously, tremendously. Yeah. They were they were kind of characters. They'd worked together for so long by this time that during their breaks they would play with toys. They had sort of mechanical trucks and tanks and whatnot, and they would race them off the floor around the studio, which was kind of fun. So you can you can tell by that that they were pretty relaxed, you know, about what they were doing. They'd done it so long that they didn't have to sort of spend every moment of their time thinking about their character and what they were going to do next. That's interesting. Um, you had a recurring role on Avonlea? Oh, Avonlea was a wonderful you know, adventure and an experience. Um, I'm, I'm sort of known as that character. I get a lot of people call yeah. me Miss Stacy, which is kind of fun, or send me letters. I still get letters from all over the world. I mean, the... Um, it's not shown here in Canada at this moment, but uh, it was shown internationally, you know, very, very widely, and it got a lot of response and uh, lots of letters and, you know, kind of talking to people about it. We still remember it. A lot of young women particularly have told me, said they, they became teachers because of this, Stacy, which makes me feel very good. I, I, I appreciate remarks like that a lot. And uh, it's somehow she... She kind of made a point, the character, Miss Stacy. I'm not talking about, you know, my performance, but that character is very meaningful, particularly to Canadians. Mm-hmm. Because it's a Canadian trail, a book that most Canadian kids will read at some point in time. So, like, everybody knows the book. So uh, it, it's kind of nice to have that memory kind of, um, you know, with me. Because there was, first of all, there was Anne of Green Gables, the... Um, the miniseries, mm-hmm. and then there was Road to Avonlea to follow it for many, many, many episodes. So uh, it's always nice to have a, a character that continues its life, and just, you know, you don't remember them for one, one situation, but continues to grow older and meet different people and marry or have children or whatnot. To develop, a chance to develop over time is great. Yeah, I, I used to see it on Disney Channel when I was a kid. Uh, there was a, uh, an episode I loved where Christopher Lloyd was a traveling con artist. Did, yeah, yeah. Did you get to work with him? Uh, no, I don't think I was in that episode. Yeah, he got, he got an Emmy for that. He deserved it. He was just so yeah. brilliant. Do you remember anything from Iron Eagle on the attack? 
I, I remember sort of going to, to, to shoot it, and uh, I remember sort of a kind of was a factory situation and lots of smoke and chemical stuff around, but it was a one-day shoot and a one-day shot, so, you know, I kind of remember it, but it, it doesn't rank high in my list of memories. I'm sure it was a wonder movie, but I had very little to do with it, really. Uh, they should have stopped after the first one. The first one had a purpose, and then the sequels was just to make money because of Louis Gossett Jr. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, making money is important. It costs a lot of money to make movies. So if you don't have any, there's no movies. Yeah. <laughs> you did voices for many uh, kids' cartoons, such as the new Scooby-Doo Mysteries, Dennis the Menace, Challenge of the Go-Bots, The Real Ghostbusters. Uh, do anything stand out um, about those? Well, they were all just fun to do. I, I'm, I do a lot of voice work, and, um, and not so much cartoon characters, but... Um, uh, I now have a, a, a podcast in which I, I read classic novels, but I love doing voice work. So, uh, you know, whether it's a character or it's reading a book, uh, it, it's great fun. But also, we, well, let's see, uh, Dennis the Menace and a few of the other series that I did, too, in L.A., mm -hmm. were, were done with a, a, a cast of characters. We were an ensemble, mm -hmm. and some very, very talented voice people, you know, working with me. And usually when you come into a uh, situation uh, where you're going to do an animated character, there's a read-through beforehand. But we were so familiar with each other and uh, knew each other, you know, worked so well and trusted each other so much that we just would do cold, cold recordings. We wouldn't, wouldn't even rehearse. We would just tape. But mm -hmm. I, I love doing that. And I also like working, you know, with, I like working with wonderful people. When you get a chance to work with wonderful people time after time, show after show, uh, it, it's it's a blessing. It's a gift and a blessing. Yeah, I mean, uh, Desta Menace had Phil Hartman, Jeannie Elias, uh, Brian George, Riva Spire. Uh, God, a lot of great people. Yeah, terrific people. Maurice Lo acting is, and also the thing is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we were asked to do some pretty ridiculous things and come up with ridiculous voices. And but we, because we never rehearsed, and we were just so trusted, we just sort of did all that sort of stuff, kind of, you know, on our own. And it was so liberating. It was like being kids again and putting on voices and playing characters. But it was a great joy. Les Lye and Abby Haggard from You Can't Do That on Television did voices for it. I, I've, I've interviewed Abby. She is hilarious. I can't believe a lot of people have never heard of her. She's a, a truly gifted performer. Yep. I don't think I know her. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Abby? Yeah, Abby Haggard is her name. No, I don't know her. I don't know her. Yeah, she's a very funny lady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the real Ghostbusters. Did you work with Laura Summer? Uh, Laura Summer? Yeah, she did the voice of Janine on, on the real Ghostbusters in the first season. I really don't remember, Tom. I say it's, it's decades ago. <laughs> okay, she's a, a guest of mine, and she's really great. When did um, your interest in photography and art begin? Well, art, I've always been interested in art. I, I sort of was born, you know, with a pencil in my hand. And, uh, well, at the time, you know, you know, little kids were, little girls especially, were said to have dancing classes or music lessons. Well, my parents had no money, so we had no piano and no music lessons and no dancing lessons. But my dad was a printer, so we had lots of paper. And I couldn't run out of paper, so I just started drawing when I was a small child and, um, and continue to this day. I still do artwork, mm -hmm. except now I do it, a lot of it digitally, you know, on my, on my iPad. Mm -hmm. And um, let me see, uh, and photography came later, actually. Photography was about, I don't know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when I first decided that I wanted to use a camera. But mostly I've been, a, you know, a painter. Uh, my photography is something I do periodically now, but uh, not something I do all the time, whereas kind of digital art is something I still do fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. Do you have galleries? Beg pardon? Do you have galleries? Oh, there are lots of galleries, too. I mean, I've had a few shows as well. Mm -hmm. um, during the, the pandemic, I've been thinking that there's, I, I'm ready for another show, but I'm kind of waiting until my schedule opens up and uh, until things are totally back to normal. I'm still not comfortable about going out and about. I'm not going to movies, and I'm not going to the theater, and I'm not going to clubs. I'll see a few friends for, you know, for, for lunch or for dinner, mm -hmm. and uh, I go to work and do, do my work, but um, I'm, not, I'm not really um, involved in anything more than that at the moment. We'll see. 
I totally get it. I looked on uh, your website. I, I love that picture you painted with the uh, the white the white naked man and the black naked girl. That is so awesome. Well, I I, I like that one too. Thank you. But that was a digital piece. There's a real prejudice, though, you know, against digital ease, against digital art. People seem to have a, an assumption, incorrect, that the machine, you know, that the, the computer does it for you. Well, it doesn't. You'll make all the choices. It's just a different medium. But there's there's a couple of people who've kind of um, contacted me because they've seen my work, you know, on my Instagram account, and they want to buy it. And then they ask me what medium is it? Oil is it acrylic? And I tell them it's digital, and they lose interest. Wow! I find that kind of interesting. But uh, I, for me, I find myself most expressive, technically, most freest mm -hmm. when I when I'm working digitally. Because when you have a brush in your hand, you're very careful about where you put your paint. Because if you make a mistake, very often you can't correct it. Sometimes you can, but. Very often you can't. Whereas digitally, if you don't like what you've done, you just go back a step and you correct it. So from that point of view, it is it is easier. But uh, it is still a creative process involving choices by the person, you know, who is the artist. It, the machine, the, the computer does not do it for you. Well, I don't think it matters uh, how it was drawn. It is beautiful. And I'm a, I'm a nudist, so it, it really represents um, nudity in a good way. Good for you. Yes. How how sort of encompassing is this nudist? I mean, do you, I mean, do you spend your time at home and without any clothes? I do, as a matter of fact. Um, I do. Oh. I do it in my bedroom, you know, because um, I live with my mother and my brother, you know, and so I, obviously I can't be nude in front of them. But when I'm in my room, I'm completely naked. Uh, interesting. And what sort of started you doing this? I just, I just have always been this way, you know. I've always been at my most comfortable when I'm naked. I like wearing clothes. <laughs> I, li I like fashion and clothes, so um, that hasn't been a temptation for me. Also, in Canada, I probably freeze, you know, being a nudist. I don't know what Canadian nudists do, but our, our climate is, is not necessarily uh, conducive to it. Yeah, I don't even think I know any Canadian nudists. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, I'm quite sure they exist, but I don't know the circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you enjoy writing? I do enjoy writing when I'm in the mood, and um, I haven't, you know, when I'm, at the moment I've, I'm focused on uh, a show that I'm doing in which I have to do some writing, but it's not literary writing, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of saying that. At some point in time I might do an autobiography, but I don't, I don't know, but I did enjoy it tremendously, and, uh, and, and, and do hope to do it again. I think you should write a memoir. I think you've got some good stories there. Yes, yes. Are you still doing radio? Oh yes, oh yes. I uh, I am the the voice uh, of a a broadcasting company here called Zoomer Media, mm -hmm. and uh, I am the voice of all their their companies. We have a classical station. We have uh, well, we have several radio stations. We have a television station, and I'm the voice of of Zoomer Media. And uh, I also created. Uh, I don't know whether you you been aware of this at all, but what you've, the background information you've gotten, but I created a, uh, um, a television show that's on every Friday night on Super Media called your all time classic kid parade. And, uh, I am, I'm the, I was the creator and I'm the host and, uh, I chose the cast and I choose the songs and then I write the intros and then I host the show. So I'm, that's really taking a lot of my time at the moment. We're about to start shooting, um, in some time in October, so um, we're down to sort of, you know, the, the end stages of what needs to be done. Nice. A any other upcoming projects? Speak your pardon? Any other upcoming projects? Uh, let me think. Um, pro no, I'm sort of kept pretty busy with that. I, uh, every Friday, as I say, I record for my podcast. I'd actually like to pump my, my, my podcast. Go right ahead. It's called Marilyn Lightstone Reads. And it is available anywhere people get podcasts. So um, I read the classics. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I've, I'm on my ace book. Uh, we've done, let's see, our first book was um, The Christmas, Car Christmas Carol, oh, yeah. Anna Green Gables, uh, Jane Eyre, Pride and Prejudice, Age of Innocence, um, a couple of others. 
and uh, so that keeps me pretty busy because when I'm not actually, you know, taping these these books, I'm also, you know, searching for the next book. Nice. And that's a great deal of fun because I get to I don't just read them; I act the book. I act do all the characters, all the different voices. So that's a different kind of voice work, but it's it's enormously satisfying. I'm gonna take a listen because I love listening to you talk. So I'm, I'm sure I'll enjoy it. Well, you know, have a shot and let me know what you think. I sure will. So real quick, we gotta play my secret silly game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, just pure fun. And okay. how the game works is, I ask you the question. You then answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. And feel free to comment on answers, because they could be funny. I'll try my best, okay. Let's see, I, uh, we, we kind of know the answer to this already. Marilyn, are you ticklish? Um, yes, I am, very. Uh, Tom, are you ticklish? Yes. Uh, if you tickle me without warning, I'll hit you in the groin, but if you let me know in advance, I'll enjoy tickling. <laughs> well, I'll make it a point to <laughs> I don't want to be hit in the groin. You wouldn't do that to me, Thelma. You wouldn't. No, I know you wouldn't. Absolutely okay, not. next question. Um, what's your favorite part of the body? And it could be anybody's anything. My favorite part of the body? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, there's so many ways in which to think what is the favorite, one to use most often, mm. one that gives you the most pleasure. I, thought, I guess I have to say favorite part of the body, the face. Okay. Because... Even more than the body, which expresses emotion, the face expresses, is most designed to express emotion. And in my, in my life as, as, a, as a performing artist, that is my job. So that's my favorite part. Nice. And Tom, what is your favorite part of the body? The belly button. <laughs> and why would that be? When I was six years old, I had my first girlfriend, and she had an adorable Audi, and she was kind of the girl that got away. We drifted apart by junior high and high school, and I, I tried to get in touch with her 15 years ago, and she was in a loveless marriage, and she was on drugs and all of that stuff. Real tragic story. And so whenever I see a belly button, I think of her. Well, I mean, have you told? I mean, have you been able to tell her this? Have you have you communicated this? I have, and uh, one of her best friends uh, told me on her behalf she was very freaked out by this. Well, really, I mean, people are sort of putting you know diamond studs in their belly button. So tell them, tell them to relax. Yes. <laughs> are you an any or an Audi? Um, I I kind of don't. I think I'm an any. Okay. I think I'm in it. I, I haven't paid much attention to it, I, I must admit. But I, now I'm just poking around trying to find, yes, definitely an Emmy. Okay. <laughs> I am too. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Black. Black, nice. Mine, and my fingernails. Nice. Mine are not painted. all sorts of colors, so not a black, but they all seem too flashy to me. There's something about black fingernails that's kind of very sophisticated. It's also someone for an older person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it draws attention to itself, but in a non-attention drawing kind of style. So I, I like it. Mine are not painted right now, but last time they were, they were purple with sparkles. Oh my goodness. Well, that must take some time to do. It does. It's a real pain in the ass, but I get it you done. you do it yourself or have someone do it for you? I, I, I've been doing it uh, myself in recent years. I used to get them done professionally, but inflation has gone up so much that I don't get them done professionally no more. Okay. Yes, it is costly. It is costly. What would you say is your best personality trait? Uh, personality trait? Oh, my. Um... I like to smile. You have a great smile, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I, yes. I, I like being, I, I try to be kind and, and pleasant to people, and I think I'm able to do that, and I think it's a two-way kind of street. I behave that way, and then I receive the same kind of behavior from the people who are responding to, to me. Wonderful. Wonderful. And you? Um, I have empathy, and I also have no filter. No filter? Yes. Oh my goodness! Oh my, that must be difficult at times. Yeah, well, it depends with the the right people, I guess. I guess. Well, that that goes for just about everything, right? Yeah. It depends on the right people. So many things in life depend on the right people. It's all subjective. It's the same axis, 
absolutely the same thing, but, you know, depending on who it is, that would can alter the change of your, you know, the part of your life that's moving on. It's, it's all subjective is what it is. And then um, my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Sorry, Tom. It's okay. For me, it's either farts or feet. <laughs> well, the company that I usually keep, keep aren't too heavy on either farts or feet, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm protected. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have a joke for you, Marilyn. I'm listening. Uh, what do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? A liar. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, everyone keeps thinking that only boys masturbate, but girls masturbate too. I know. I don't know what, what is up with that, you know, that uh, people uh, bring out that stereotype. Well, it's something that was considered, girls were not supposed to have sexual feelings, you know, during the time I was growing up. Mm -hmm. But the, the girls themselves knew, knew different because uh, that's biology. It, it has nothing to do with the, the, the culture of the moment. But the culture in which I grew up, you know, was really quite repressive. Girls were sort of kept, knew they had to know their place at the time. Yeah, sounds like uh, government propaganda to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just the mores of the time. Remember, I, I grew up in a different time than you, Tom. I know, I know. It's Child just... in the 40s. I was born in 1940. I know, it's just so different now, you know, I mean, a lot of things in hindsight looks like just, you know, you know, government propaganda and, and social propaganda and, and everything, it's weird, you know, just like, you know, if, if someone was caught having premarital sex, they would get arrested. Well, everyone, you know, the morality, what was considered moral and proper behavior was different at the time. Different times bring out different mores, and uh, those were the mores of the time. The mores of, I, you know, you can say I disapprove of those mores, but I don't even know if, if I approve of the ones today. I mean, you have to be sort of pick and choose as to what you think is, is proper and right and pleasurable. But at the end of it all, I think what everyone does in the privacy of their own home is their own business, and no one should, you know, no one should censure them for it. I totally agree. Marilyn, thank you so much for coming on today. I hope this was painless for you. It, it was painless. I just having a, having a little trouble hearing, but I think we, we made it through all right, Tom. I thank you for thinking of me. Absolutely. You know, I've been, I've, been, I've been trying to get connected with you since I started five years ago. I'm finally, I'm glad that we finally did through Instagram. It's amazing. Me too. Me too. Well, I'm going to... I'm going to take a listen to your podcast and be safe out there and keep on being creative because I will pay attention to anything that you have out. Thank you so much, Tom. I'll do my best. My pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Marilyn Lightstone. Ain't she a sweetheart? Great lady, huh? Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> You know, I'd waited five years for this interview and stuff. And yeah, she didn't remember a lot of stuff, but it was a great conversation and she's interesting and she's not judgmental. So it was a great talk and I'm glad I got to talk to her today. Long live the queen. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes.